Hi there and welcome to PhD at Living. You ever wonder why bread gets that nice brown crust on it and steaks have that delicious sear? Well, it's all because of our topic for today, the Maillard reaction. Not Maillard or Maillard or, God forbid, Mallard. Hey, even I pronounced it incorrectly before. But from this point forward, let it never be said you weren't told. Technically, the Maillard reaction is a type of non-enzymatic browning. And yes, it begs the question, what's enzymatic browning? Well, think of a cut apple slice turning brown or the peel of a banana turning brown. Happy? The non-enzymatic browning of the Maillard reaction happens between amino acids and proteins and reducing sugars. This separates it from caramelization, which is a process purely composed of sugar molecules. The sugar specifically has to be a reducing sugar, meaning it has a free aldehyde or ketone group when the sugar is projected in its linear form. Now that I say that, it makes no sense, so let's just go to the board. In order for a sugar to be able to reduce something, it needs to have a free, that is, unreacted, aldehyde or ketone group. Let's look at it by way of example. Here's the Fischer projection linear form of D-glucose, and we can see, in fact, we have a free aldehyde group. The problem with looking at the D-glucose in the cyclic form is that the aldehyde group here is going to react with the OH group on the 5 carbon. So it doesn't look like there's a free aldehyde group, and truthfully, in the cyclic form there isn't. However, you can just as easily isomerize, blow that structure back open, and have the linear form where again we can see the aldehyde is in fact free and able to react slash reduce stuff. Alright, smarty pants, how's a ketone going to reduce anything? For that, let's take a look at the Fischer projection of D-fructose. Instead of having the aldehyde up here in glucose, we instead have a ketone on carbon number 2. Essentially what happens here is we tautomerize, meaning we move from one form to another by this reaction where the oxygen comes over here, plucks the hydrogen, the hydrogen gives its electrons back to the carbon, the carbon moves it from 1 into 2 to make a double bond, and then the electrons from carbon number 2 move back into the oxygen, leaving us with... This intermediate here, which you can see has neither an aldehyde nor a ketone, and in fact has an alkene double bond between carbon-1 and carbon-2. We can play ring around the electron again and leave our final tautomerization product of this final product here. And hey, what do you know? It's got a free aldehyde. Here we can see two big things about monosaccharides. First, they're all reducing sugars, because they will have in their linear forms either a free aldehyde or a free ketone. And even for the free ketones, the ketoses, monosaccharides, they'll be able to tautomerize from that position up into creating a free aldehyde that, again, does the reducing. With disaccharides, things get a little bit dicey. I don't have six fingers on my hand, so you'll just have to forgive me. If I take something like glucose, which has a one aldehyde, and I have a fructose, which has a two ketone, and link them together via a glycosidic bond, I end up with the disaccharide sucrose. The problem with this is because I am linking the aldehyde carbon of glucose and the ketone carbon of fructose together in my glycosidic bond, I can't reduce anymore. The reason is because I can't blow apart this glycosidic bond the same way I can easily switch from the linear to the cyclic form in the monosaccharide. In my glycosidic bond formation, I'm losing water through a dehydration mechanism that creates that glycosidic bond. Therefore, because sucrose is reacting the monosaccharide anomeric carbon, meaning the one with the aldehyde or the ketone of glucose and the anomeric carbon of fructose together, I can't reduce. On the flip side, if I look at something like the disaccharide lactose, I see that I still have a glucose with the one aldehyde anomeric carbon, but instead of a fructose that has a two ketone anomeric carbon, I have a galactose, which also has a one anomeric aldehyde carbon. The difference between glucose and galactose is in that four carbon there, and enantiomerically it kind of makes sense, but that's not important. The difference between sucrose and lactose that makes one a reducing sugar and one not a reducing sugar is how the anomeric carbons are glycosidically bonded. In sucrose, I have my glucose and my fructose, they are glycosidically bonded at the anomeric carbons, which means they can't reduce because you can't expand them to the linear form and have a free aldehyde or ketone. In lactose, however, I still have my one aldehyde glucose, but it bonds with the four carbon on galactose. So I have a one four glycosidic bond, which leaves the one anomeric carbon from the galactose able to react, reduce when you expand it into the linear form. And that is why some disaccharides are reducing and other Others are not. Cool, huh? All this is a super long and winding explanation to essentially say in order for the Maillard to happen, you have to have a reducing sugar such as glucose, fructose, lactose, or maltose. On the other half of the reaction is our amino acid, composed of an amino group here and an acid group here. 
Go figure, descriptive name. There's also an R group in the middle here on this second carbon, and that's what differentiates one amino acid from another. Link a whole pile of these together, and you get a protein. That's the other half of what reacts with our reducing sugar in the Maillard. If you're interested in amino acids and proteins and some additional chemistry that they're involved in, check out my video on the gibbs marangoni effect in wine and whiskey. And that all brings us, finally, to the Maillard reaction. You see we have our amino group here with its R substituent and our aldehyde group with its R prime substituent. The first step of the reaction is the nucleophilic nitrogen attacks the carbonyl carbon, the carbonyl carbon kicks the electrons back to the oxygen, the oxygen attacks the hydrogen on the amino group, it kicks its electrons back to the nitrogen, and through a series of intermediates, like this one, which uses perhaps the craziest instance of the water lasso mechanism I have ever seen, pluck it out and connect the ends, giving us this guy with the cool C double bond N imine bond. We have to expand the R prime on the aldehyde group here to include a second carbon in the hydroxyl group because eventually these electrons want to bounce over and give us an alkene group, C double bond C, and then pop over into the oxygen here, giving us our final product of this thing here. Starting at that alpha hydroxy imine group, that whole process is called an amidori rearrangement to end up with this, and it's one of the preliminary reactions in our Maillard mechanism. Do this a thousand different times, a thousand different ways, and you end up with bigger and bigger molecules getting into aromatic compounds and a class of molecules called melanoidins, which are those wonderful, beautiful, brown, tasty molecules that we get at the end of our Maillard. This whole reaction happens at 140 to 165 C. 280 to 330 Fahrenheit for those of you playing in the United States, or Myanmar or Liberia. At higher temperatures, we can create the molecule acrylamide. This is bad because acrylamide is toxic. Let's say we start with our linear glucose here, six carbons with an aldehyde at the end, and the amino acid asparagine over here. We create this amide bond where there was none before. Our next step is that we decarboxylate, so we find carbon dioxide, CO2, pluck that out. It ends up creating this C double bond N here, and through another couple reactions, we take this entire chunk off and end up with a C double bond C here, giving us the villain of our video, acrylamide. Interestingly, in a high temperature Maillard scenario, something like potatoes or another cereal grain are more likely to create the acrylamide because that asparagine amino acid content is higher. Finally, if you ever watch a cooking show, you'll see the self-righteous host talk about how cool, awesome, amazing, wonderful hashtag science, bro, it is that if you increase the pH, you increase the browning in the myelid larger reaction. And the reason the browning happens is because you increase the pH. Circular reasoning aside, let's look at what the hell's actually going on here. In our amino acid, knowing that that's half of our Maillard reaction, we have an acid group and an amino group. Both of these are susceptible to pH changes, but we're going to look more at the amino group because that's the one that's actually participating in our Maillard. In a very, very low pH environment, we might even be able to protonate this NH2 amino group. What we mean by that is we add another hydrogen proton and we eliminate this electron lone pair. In addition, because the nitrogen has four single bonds, bonds, it has a positive charge. Therefore, for the nitrogen's nucleophilicity, that is the ability for that nitrogen to want positive charges and for its electrons to attack it with a positive charge already, that nitrogen is absolutely not going to be nucleophilic at all. Going back to a neutral pH scenario, as the pH increases, we remove that proton, we get rid of the positive charge, that electron lone pair comes back, and we have a nice, wonderful neutral amino group. Here, this is our normal scenario where we get a decent amount of that Maillard happening when the amino attacks that reducing sugar. At a very, very high pH, we can make the nucleophilicity of this amino group much, much higher. And that, my friends, is the hashtag science of why increasing the pH increases the Maillard reaction. If you make the amino group more nucleophilic, it is more likely to attack the reducing sugar and give you more Maillard. Interestingly, the browning in bread making is predominantly from the Maillard reaction. We tend to think of breads as being very carb heavy, but they also have a decent amount of protein, namely gluten. In addition, most baked goods that have a lot of extra sugar added have a combination, caramelization, and Maillard reaction happening. But at the end of the day, if your stuff turns brown, there's probably a good chance the Maillard is happening. And that, my friends, is the chemistry of the Maillard reaction. The delicious, delicious Maillard. See y'all next time. Firm, but with a little give. Yep, these are medium rare. What if somebody wants theirs well done? We ask them politely, yet firmly, to leave. <laughs>